We're in our series called Busy, and we've been looking at what it looks like to be busy, but we didn't have to spend a lot of time on that because you know what it's like to be busy because most of you are busy. And uh, you know the demands, the everyday regular demands of life that crowd your life, added on top of that with things like um, your media consumption and thousands and thousands of ads specifically targeted just to you uh, based on your like, search history and how you interact with people online and those kinds of things, all vying, even battling for your attention, battling for your affection. And uh, so we've been looking at what does it look like to be distracted? How do we overcome distraction? We looked at how do we <clears throat> overcome distraction when you are around people and actually be present where you are? Many of you will have had some sort of Father's Day events over the last couple of days. Um, and it's tough when you get together with family because all the spinning plates of your week don't all of a sudden stop spinning. Uh, that social media is not going to... Like those reels don't watch themselves. Those talks don't tick themselves, for example. <clears throat> uh, the news cycle doesn't stop just because Father's Day. And whatever, like whatever it is you're into... Uh, computer game, uh, interest, hobbies, work even, continues to cycle around your mind. That <clears throat> conversation you had with that person and all of a sudden you thought of the great comeback and then you're just stewing about it. You're like, oh man, I wish I'd said this. Good or bad, I'm not suggesting you, you, know, you were going to slam them down, but you, know, you, you thought of, oh, I should have said this. And you're still thinking about these things. It's hard to be present. We looked at that. Uh, we looked at... Um, how do you rest? Like, how do you actually rest? We looked at uh, Jesus and his invitation for you to come into his rest. And today, we're going to be looking at the fight for your family. So um, I realize we've just kind of like gotten straight into it. So what I might do is pray, and then we'll have a look in Scripture about why would we, why would we be talking about fight for the family? Why on a I mean, Father's Day, I guess, is a bit of kind of, you know, good synergy there. Um, didn't plan it this way, but here we are. We didn't sing Good, Good Father today. So this is, this is what we're doing instead. <clears throat> um, but it's, it's a big deal because even though we've looked at a bunch of these things for us individually, how do we join the battle for our affection? Because if we don't join the battle, there is already a battle for your affection. There is already a battle for your attention. If we don't join that battle and utilize the weapons that God has given us, we've already lost the battle if we don't know that it's going on and if we don't join the battle. If we're not present when we are with people, we will miss out on the depths of the joys of life and risk never really being known and never really knowing others. If we never rest, and more importantly, if we never enter into the rest of Jesus, we will always be restless so today what we're going to be looking at is not just for ourselves, but how do we fight for these things for our family? And when I say family, I don't just mean, you know, a mummy and a daddy and kids, although absolutely that means family. We have single mums among us, single fathers among us. Uh, we have grandparents who are guardians and carers for young kids. We've got siblings who live together. We've got a church family, brothers and sisters in Christ. And so when we look at fighting for your family, we're talking about all of our kinds of families. I know today's Father's Day. I know 100% for sure that there are people today who are having a, I mean, a grievous day. They're grieving today because they wish they had a good relationship with their father or because they do have a relationship with their father and wish that they didn't have a relationship with their father or their father's died or they want to be a father and yet hasn't happened for them. And man, pick, pick your reason. There are so many reasons for heartache today, but there are also many, many reasons for us to celebrate fathers today, especially our, our great heavenly father who loves us. And as we'll see today, I know I'm getting into it, I haven't even prayed yet. As we'll see today, man, oh, it's not just fathers, but it is upon us all to fight for our family. 
I don't get to know. Let's, let's, let's pray. Let's get into some scripture and um, we'll see what God would have for us today. Father, I want to thank you so much for your kindness towards us that we can call you Father. You love us. You have treated us not as we deserve, but as your perfect son Jesus deserves. You're so wonderful to us. Help us today as we are looking into your scriptures, stepping into the battle for our attention and our affection, that we don't just battle alone, but, and not even just for ourselves, but we battle with you, with our family, and for our family. And so help us today to gain the mind of Christ in our thinking. Fill us with your spirit and help us to gain understanding from your scriptures. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, looking at fighting for your family. And even if you are a kid, this still applies to you. Although I will say that, as we'll see in Scripture, there is a particular responsibility on the strong to look after the weak. And there is a particular responsibility um, because, of, because of an inherent strength, physical strength, uh, a financial strength, uh, that there is a particular responsibility on men for their families. Let me read and help you understand why. I'm not saying there's no responsibility for anybody else. I'm saying there is a particular responsibility for the blokes. I'm going to talk about a story from Nehemiah today. Uh, Nehemiah is a, um, it's a book of the Bible. He is a guy who lived and usually churches go through the book of Nehemiah when they're working on some sort of building project where they want money, people to rally around a common vision. <clears throat> We're going to go through the book of Nehemiah. Uh, let's build this building because it's all about building. Uh, Nehemiah is he's one of the people of God. He's a Jew, but he's not in Jerusalem. He's not in Judea, uh, Judah. Sorry, He's not in uh, Israel. He is in exile with most of the rest of the people of God, a conquered people. But 70 years earlier, a remnant of Jews went back to Jerusalem because the temple was in disrepair. And they're like, we've got to, re- we've got to restore the temple. But for 70 years, we're down in Nehemiah. He served King Xerxes, the ruler, like one of the biggest, most, like most powerful rulers in the world at the time. And Nehemiah worked for him. And he loved God. He loved Jerusalem, the city of God. That was supposed to be a city on a hill, supposed to be a banner waving high, reflecting the glory of God out to all the nations. That's what Jerusalem was supposed to be. And it was in ruins. And the wall around it was in ruins. And Nehemiah's like, man, we've got to go build Jerusalem again. And so he goes to King Xerxes and says, King, can I please go for the glory of God? to build a wall so that we can rebuild this city. Uh, He didn't want to go in and rebuild the city, only to then have some other conquering nation come in and destroy them or rout them again because they didn't have any uh, defences. So he goes to build a wall. And this is where we kind of pick it up today because the neighbouring cities and rulers didn't like that Jerusalem was being rebuilt, certainly didn't like it was becoming a fortified city again that had defences. That was a threat to the neighbouring rulers. And so they conspired against Nehemiah and against the Jews to come and kill them all before they could establish this military outpost in their um, area. People of God were under significant pressure. Attacks were imminent. And here's where we pick it up in Nehemiah 4. In Judah, which is the area, like saying in, in South Australia, but this is in Judah. It was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. So man, words going around. The wall is in disrepair. There's too much rubble. It's too hard. And our enemies are coming for us. At this time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, you must return to us. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, 
I, that's Nehemiah, stationed the people by their clans. He put them into their families by their sword, oh, sorry, with their swords, their spears and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. He, this is the brave heart moment of Nehemiah where he's up on the you know, figurative horse and you know, blue paint and he's giving the, if we don't unite and fight, we're going to die. And so he says, here's the problem. We're on an imminent attack, but we're doing this absolute worthwhile goal for the glory of God. He said, here's the problem. Here's what we're going to do. Firstly, we're going to remember God what he has done for us, then we're going to fight for our family. The battle for your your family's attention, the battle for their presence, and the battle for their rest is absolutely worth your joining the battle. And again, I'm not just talking about, you might go, well, I don't have a, I don't don't, like have a husband or a wife or kids. Uh, there are many kinds of family and all of those kinds of family need you to join the fight for them. God has placed you in your family, placed you in your household, placed you in your neighbourhood, placed you in your church family or if you're in this church family, in this church family. He's placed you in a family. Brothers and sisters. And there is, we've already identified over the last three weeks, there is a battle going on for each and every one of you, for your affection and for your attention. And we've looked at how do we fight, how do we join the battle for ourselves. Today we're going to look at how do we join the battle for our family. We see here in this passage, uh, Nehemiah has given his people both the tools to build something together, they are building for their family, and the tools to battle for their family, to fight for their family. And likewise, God has given us tools to build for our family and to fight for our family. There's no reason to fight for a family if there's nothing to build for. If the only reason to fight for your family is to survive another day, all we're doing is continually fighting until we die anyway. There must be something that we're building. It's not just perennial battle and then you die one day. It is God is building something. There is a common goal they're working towards. Uh, Secondly, we understand we have the tools, we have the weapons. We know our family is under attack. For some of you, this will come as no surprise. This is not new news. You're like, yeah, I know my family is under attack. I was catching up with a family yesterday and they were just going, man, Monday this happened. Tuesday, we thought someone was going to die in the family. Wednesday, this part of our house nearly blew up. They're like, something is going on. Like, we are, we are under attack. Something's happening. But even if your week's not like that family's week, uh, you are under attack. How do we fight for our family? Nehemiah's battle was physical. They were coming with swords and bows and horses. <clears throat> our battle is not physical. Our battle is spiritual. Our battle isn't against people. Let me read from Scripture. This is in Ephesians 6. We'll be in Ephesians 6 a little bit tonight. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. He says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Nehemiah's was against people. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. Just because we don't have people knocking at our door, wanting to physically harm us, doesn't mean that there aren't people battling for your attention and for your worship. This is what Jesus says of those kinds of people. He says in John 10, uh, A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I've come so that you may have life and life in abundance. You might have heard this passage preached on saying it's about the devil. It's not about the devil. Jesus tells us this is about false shepherds, people who want to come and distract you, who want to disciple you, but not disciple you into Christ-likeness, not to point you to Jesus, but to point you to them, or to point you to, to, to get you to help build their kingdom, not 
God's kingdom, grow their prestige, grow their power, grow their platform. That's the thief. And there are many of those. There are billion, trillion dollar companies that are experts in you. They know exactly how you think, exactly what you want. They know your, again, they know your search history and your, how you interact with people online so that they can specifically message to you things that they want. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to help you understand the battle that's going on. In fact, I, I don't think we should be scared, and I'll, I'll show you how later. There are also spiritual powers, and even Satan. Uh, Peter says that he, Satan is like a lion who prowls around looking for who he can devour. There is a spiritual battle going on, a fight for your attention and for your affection. And if you're not in the fight, you've already lost. And it's not just for us. We need to fight for our families as well. How else do we fight? Firstly, again, we need to know it's a spiritual battle. Second, we need to use what God has given us. He hasn't left us unarmed for the battle. God has given us everything we need. Uh, Firstly, let's look at uh, 2 Timothy. God has given us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Every single Christian, whether you feel powerful or not, you have the Holy Spirit. Empowered by the Spirit to love, empowered by the Spirit to be disciplined, given power by the Spirit. Power without love and without self-control is uh, is chaos. You don't know what you're going to get. Power with discipline without love is incredibly dangerous. Someone who's powerful and disciplined but does not love you, that's what these false shepherds Jesus was warning us about. Uh, That's more like what they're like. If you are disciplined but don't have love and don't have power, you might have a nice life yourself but won't be very useful in the battle. If you just have love but don't have have power and don't have self-control, you may have great affection but little fruit, but you have been given a spirit not of timidity, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Power and love and self-control. The Holy Spirit is living in you. God's greatest gift is himself. And he's given you himself in the greatest of abundance. What else has he given us? We see in Ephesians 6 again, Paul writes, finally be strengthened by the Lord. I mean, you're strengthened by him because you have the Holy Spirit. But he goes on, be strengthened by the Lord and his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Stand therefore, a little later, with the truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. It says, you are already in a spiritual battle and God has gifted you armor and weaponry for the battle. What is it? It is truth. It's righteousness. It's the gospel. Not just for salvation, although it is the only power unto salvation, but also for every day, the gospel. Also faith. God has gifted you faith. It's not about us trying to muster up faith not about us trying to work ourselves up into a frenzy. God has gifted us faith and he's given us his scriptures. But if we're not using the weapons he's given us, even if we acknowledge we're in a battle, even for ourselves, let alone for our families, we acknowledge we're in a battle and we try to fight in a battle without the tools God has given us, with the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, I don't know how we're going to do it. We're not going to do it. It's for this reason and take up the full armor of God, all of it. We've mentioned before that too many Christian streakers just were in the helmet of salvation. It's a streaker with a cool hat and fine for you in a sense. Uh, but what hope do you have of fighting for your family when all you're wearing is a helmet? It's not going to happen. Take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist 
in the evil day and having prepared everything, take your stand. And he finishes the thought, pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request. Stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. So say, man, you have the Holy Spirit, power, love, self-control. We need all of those things. We need the Holy Spirit who lives in us, empowers us in the battle. He's given us truth, and righteousness, the gospel, faith, and uh, I forgot the last one, scripture, the Bible. We need to be using these weapons and armor of war for the battle. And then he says, we need to pray. We need to understand that God is the victor already. God is the one who is sovereign and, and mighty and high above everything. In fact, the, the next thing, how do we fight the battle? We need to remember we are not alone. You're not in the battle alone. You may feel like you've been battling alone. You may, be feel, like, you may be feel like you've been battling alone for a very long time. You are not alone. You're not alone. Nehemiah's call. He says, remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. He says you need to remember what God has done. Remember who God is. Remember his might and his power. Deuteronomy 4, uh, the writer says, Be on your guard and diligently watch yourselves, so you don't forget the things your eyes have seen, and so that they don't slip from your mind as long as you live. Teach them to your children and your grandchildren. Remind yourself of what God has done. This is one of the keys to, to winning the battle. Reminding ourselves of what God has done and then teaching them to our kids. Teaching them to our kids' kids. If you don't have kids, there are kids in this church family who need you to be speaking these same words of life and of hope to them. Reminding them, this is what God has done for me and for you. And, and it's a thing that goes on from generation to generation as we teach our kids and our grandkids and then our kids teach their kids and their grandkids. We're always, always reminding ourselves of what God has done. He's with us in the battle. We need to remember he is there. He has never failed in the past. He is with us even now. We need to remind ourselves not just of what he's done, but he's with us still. Be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Paul writes, before we put on the armor of God, it all starts with God. It's not just God sitting back like a general giving us armor, saying, go for it, guys, and then critiquing us along the way. Oh, yeah, swing it. Swing this up. Shoot up a little. Oh, that looks like it hurts. That's not the same. That's not the kind of God we have. He is with us. Be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. This is what Nehemiah says after he says, remember God and fight for your family. He says, when our enemies heard that we knew their scheme, and that God had frustrated it, every one of us returned to his own work on the wall. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half had spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers supported all the people of Judah who were rebuilding the wall. The laborers who carried the loads worked with one hand and held a weapon in the other. Each of the builders had his sword strapped around his waist while he was building, and the one who sounded the ram's horn was beside me. Then I said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, the work is enormous and spread out, we're separated far from one another along the wall. Whenever you hear the sound of the ram's horn, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work. While half of the men were holding spears from daybreak until the stars came out, at that time I also said to the people, let everyone and his servants spend the night inside Jerusalem so that they can stand guard by night and work by day. And I, my brothers, my servants, and the men of the guard were with me. We never took off our clothes. Each carried his weapon, even when washing. <clears throat> he said, man, we, he had stationed people in their families along the wall. See, the wall hadn't been like totally crumbled. Some of it was still standing, but a wall is absolutely useless unless the wall is complete. I don't know if you've seen those, um, <clears throat> you know, us, us, he, it pops up every you know, couple of months around the internet, a picture of a gate, but with no fence either side. People saying, how useless is a gate with no fence. That's the same amount of usefulness as a wall with giant holes in it to defend a city. And so it stationed families with the families at all of the broken down parts of the wall. But man, the wall went all the way around the city. It was vast. The work was massive. And each family couldn't just battle alone. 
It wasn't like the families were, were these kind of discrete atomistic units that uh, had nothing to do with one another. And, oh, this is my section. That's your section. If you get attacked, we're just going to stay over here. No, he says, half of the people held weapons. Half of them held tools. Even the ones who held tools had a sword in one hand, bricks in the other. Had mortar in one hand and a trowel in the other. Uh, a mortar and a, let's go, a bow in the other. Uh, a shield in one hand and a hammer in the other. You might think that, does, that doesn't sound particularly efficient. Two-thirds weaponry, uh, three-quarters weaponry even. They're working together. And even if one section was to be attacked, they would blow the horn to alert everybody to come together in unity to fight for their family. God fights for you and we're in the fight together. We need each other. Not just the family that lives in your house, but we the family of God. We need each other. We, this is one of those kind of well-worn verses that's here like Galatians 6 2. We need to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If we don't bear one another's burdens, we are not fulfilling the law of Christ, which means that we need people to carry burdens and we need people who have burdens to be born. We can't do without burdensome people. We need you and we need people who can bear burdens. God has given us so many gifts. One of the great gifts of God is his church family. In our discipleship groups, for 10 years now, 10 years in the life of the church, our DGs have had some of the most, some of our DGs have had some of the most amazing stories of people coming to know Jesus. Uh, we've baptized hundreds of people. Most of them have become Christians in and through discipleship groups. There are people, I remember, I shared the story this morning of um, in the early days when uh, first 150 people or so of City Light were aged between 18 and 23, and then there were a couple of us oldies in our early 30s, mostly very young. And uh, our discipleship groups were, I mean, booming because we were actually discipling people, the hunger for these people who, be, who were becoming Christians to know Jesus. And grow, and grow to be like him, had an older gentleman go and visit one of our young men's discipleship group. Most of these guys would have been 19 years old. And he comes to me afterwards, very mature, very wise. I respect this guy so much. And he said to me, you have got a huge problem in your church. And I was like, I need to, I, you're, I need to hear what you have to say. And he said, I went to the discipleship group. Almost every one of these young blokes was confessing about uh, various things that they were struggling with, sin that they were wanting to overcome, uh, and it's just rampant. And I said, that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is we have people who are so desperate to be like Jesus. They're not holding anything in the dark, but bringing everything into the light so that the light might disinfect their souls as they become more like Jesus. We need to be a family that fights for one another. These young men were praying for one another. They were accountable to one another. Uh, they were growing up to be more like Jesus with one another. And by God's grace, that kind of life on life has been a feature of many, many, many discipleship, dozens of discipleship groups over the last 10 years. One of the problems is... <clears throat> We have, I mean, I thank God, not massively at City Light, but uh, for Beth, my wife and I, we, we do a lot of work with people who aren't in this church. And one of the things that we find over and over and over again is, especially in families, but even in churches, is men in particular who are not fighting for their family, not fighting for their wife and for their kids, not fighting for their church family. And I couldn't tell you how many hours a week I'm spending with people, blokes and wives and kids, 
from families that have not fought for one another. Men in particular who they're not building and they're not defending. They don't have a, a hammer and they don't have a sword or a shield. Men who have either uh, stopped trying, given up, or even boosted themselves. Uh, it's a shocker, actually. And in fact, one of, one of the most, uh, just to kind of, you know, uh, open up the bonnet a little bit here, one of the hardest things as an elder in any church, but in this church, has been to see young women who have never stepped foot in a church before in their lives come into this community, meet Jesus, have a, an amazing, life-transforming uh, faith um, in Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, and then to see them get totally messed around by immature Christian blokes, and then to see them treated nicely by non-Christians and then whoo, evaporate out of the church. Because not just young men, but old men uh, have not acknowledged there's a battle for their affection, for their attention. And so they're not even in the battle for themselves, let alone the battle for their family. We need to be in the battle for our families. We need to be in the battle for ourselves, at least, and the battle for our family. God has given us a gift again, given us each other. Uh, it is a wonderful gift. Um, I read this quote this week um, for parents in particular. When we treat church as optional, and I don't mean just the Sunday gathering, I mean just being committed in a, fam- in a church family. When we treat the church as optional, don't be surprised when the next generation sees it as unnecessary. When we say, well, actually, we are just going to be our little bit of the wall. We're going to build this bit of the wall. And so long as we're doing okay, we're, we are fine and... It doesn't really matter. Actually, there are no Christian Rambos. There are no Christian kind of solo artists. Um, There are no just me against the world. There are no me and my partner against the world. There are no just me and my family against the world. Uh, It is an individual in a family, in a bigger family, in a bigger family, in the global family of God. And we are built for each other, and we need each other, because if we are going to be this atomistic, my family, my family, my family, or me as an individual, the enemy's going to come, the horn's not going to blow, and we're going to die. I see it happen over and over and over again. What are we fighting for? In the, uh, the spiritual battle that we are in, the weapons of war are also the tools of building. So when Paul says, what is this armor of God? It's not just an armor for battle. It's an, it's, they are tools for building. Truth, righteousness, the gospel, faith, and scripture are for building. It is very easy to have uh, unity with one another when there's a an existential threat. For the people of God, the Jews in Nehemiah's time, he could get up and say, hey guys, if we don't do this together, if we don't maintain, pursue and maintain our unity, not only are you going to die, we are all going to die. It's, it's e- let's say, easier. It's easier to maintain unity when your life is literally on the line. It's very difficult to maintain unity when things are comfortable and easy. When there's no existential threat, Everybody tends to just do what's right in their own eyes. It doesn't matter if I just go do my own thing because I'm probably not going to die, like physically die today. And so we just die actually the slow death of a thousand poor decisions. We, don't, we forget that we're in a battle for our, te- uh, for our attention and for our affection. We forget that we are called to... No, no, we're not called to unity. We are unified in Christ. We're already united with one another because we are already united in Christ. So the question isn't, are, you, are we united or not? The question is, what is the quality and caliber of our union? Because we, we are already united in Christ. In Nehemiah, they have this common goal, live. 
It's not just live. It's rebuild the wall so we can rebuild the city so that the glory of God can once again be a banner waved high, city on a hill for the whole world to see the goodness of God who loves them. And we forget that we also have a common goal, which is also the glory of God, which is also our own Christ-likeness. And because we are united to one another and because we love our brothers and sisters, our family, we want to fight for their holiness too. Instead, when it becomes comfortable, <clears throat> when we're in peacetime, we start to compare our lives to one another. Oh, that person's got that and I don't have that. Or life's so easy for them and so difficult for me. Or we start to compete with one another. Oh, you think you're good, I'm going to try this thing. Or small issues become big issues because we know there's a battle going on somewhere. We feel the battle. We feel the effects of the fight. But actually pick, we're picking the wrong battles. Instead of fighting for our family, we start fighting our family. Because we forget what unites us. It's very difficult to maintain unity when it's comfortable. Easier to maintain unity in the fight when there's, when there's a battle going on. How difficult is it and how dangerous it is, is it to not maintain unity when there is a battle going on, but we think we're comfortable. Life's easy. I can just cruise, and I don't, I don't, like it's not like there's a big gaping hole in the wall in front of me and an enemy standing right there with a, you know, a, a, an arrow pointed at my face. But in a spiritual sense, that's exactly what it's like. And we need each other. We have this primary overarching goal, the glory of God. We are in the battle, even though our material lives, physical lives seem so comfortable. Uh, the battle for your attention and for your affection, for your worship, and for the worship of your family is raging. And many of us have not joined the battle. And many of us who see the battle have not picked up the weapons that God has gifted us to actually go and win the battle. Truth is, you're not alone because God has given you us together. And we are not alone because God fights for us. Again, let me read that last part from Nehemiah. Whenever you hear the sound of the ram's horn, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work. Well, half of the men were holding spears from daybreak until the stars came out. And it's hard work. It's not, it's not easy. I said before, we need burdensome people. You might have heard that and gone, what? That, that, that's not what our culture does. <clears throat> our culture sidelines all the burdensome people. Go hang out in this hospital together or institution together or just over there so that we can maintain our comfort. Uh, no, no, we, we are made for one another. We need one another. We need burdens and burden bearers because we're in the fight together. And God is in the fight with us. And the best news of all, he's already won the fight. This is one of the reasons that Nehemiah tells his people, remind yourself what God has done. He never loses. Remind yourself God is in the battle with us right now. He never loses. Remind yourself of what those good works that God has prepared in advance for you to walk in so that we're not just never-ending battle, but we're actually building with the one hand even though we're defending with the other. Uh, tonight, I want to invite you, if you haven't already, uh, to join the battle and fight for your family. This is not a, like a call to physical arms. I'm not trying to G you up. I'm just trying to help you understand there is already a battle going on for your affection, for your attention, and for your family's attention and affection. We don't want to be complacent. We don't want to grow comfortable and lazy. Uh, but we've been given a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. So we want to be disciplined in our love, disciplined in our exercise of power. We want to pick up those weapons of war, which are not violent. Join God in the battle and win. What does winning look like? It looks like the glory of God. It looks like us growing together in the likeness of Jesus.
Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for your scriptures. Thank you that you fight for us. Jesus has won the battle already. You, again, you're such a good God, so loving. I just want to acknowledge your power and your might today. You're glorious and high above all things. Do as you please and you please to love us, consider us, be with us. God, you're so good. Help us to understand your goodness. Please, would you remind us of your goodness and your power. Help us to keep in step with your spirit. Not to be timid, not to shy away from the battle that's already going on, but to pick up those weapons of war you've given us, to go and fight with you for your glory, for our joy, and for the good of our family. Help us to love our family so much that we desire um, their good enough for us to join the battle on their behalf. Father, help us to link arms as brothers and sisters to live into the unity we already have in Jesus. Father, help us to not get distracted, not to get discouraged, not to divert our affection and our worship away from you into anything else, but never way to bring you glory to uh, in our own lives and in our community, wave the banner of your glory so that all people could see your glory, your goodness, your majesty, and your love for them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.